Yes, so I am first man Rastafari living here in the tropical island of Jamaica. You're going to be having a very special wake and bake moment with Captain Huta right there in your homes. Yeah, man, take care of Captain Huta and give it to the world as best as you can. It's Captain Huda. everybody, what's happening? Hooter here, coming to you high and alive. Making my life a little more colorful. You know, sometimes it's a good thing to make your life a little more colorful. And I want to guarantee you one thing. The amazing interview you're going to hear today is going to leave your life a lot more colorful. So, Without any further ado, and I'm not going to waste any time because this is a long interview and it's going to be absolutely amazing. Please enjoy this interview with my mentor, Max Montrose. Recording is in progress. You're on. <laughs> Captain <laughs> Hootah! <laughs> oh, man. It's my master, my oh. master. What's a, do, we have, do we have an official, like, greeting? You know, like the... The, the the Jedi. Do I have to pull out a, a microscope and do one of these maybe? And <laughs> that'd be cool. You know, How most you? people don't know what uh, where Spock actually got this from, um, and where it comes from is crazy, crazy interesting. But that's for a more esoteric conversation elsewhere well we'll just keep it to to drugs here uh oh, but really? uh, well we don't have to i mean if you want to talk about i've got a few notes aliens <laughs> or secret societies all the other shit i love you uh i mean this is your time with me i have no agenda captain so you you can ask me whatever you want my man I thank you. And first of all, thank you so much. I know how busy you are. And, and I, I, you know, it's, it's an honor. So I'm not going to fuck around at all. First of all, step one, I waited two months for this pipe. It arrived two days ago. This is one of, it's called a freeze pipe. It's got glycerin on the inside and uh, uh, a little bubbler down here. And it took two months to get to me here in Portugal. And I wanted to wait until I had you here and do a ceremonial uh, uh, cheers to you. Thank Hi. you. Yeah. yeah. It, you are the master. Thank you. And I, we your... wouldn't be here without you. So whatever, hit, hit that pipe and tell me how it is. And for anybody out there who thinks I'm responsible for giving captain this pipe, you're wrong. <laughs> I have nothing to do with how he got this pipe. I'm just lucky enough. He wanted to take the first hit with me present. Oh. That, how, was that? how was that? How was, how is that? That's smooth, man. So the whole idea is it's supposed to be like reduce all of the uh, all of the uh, heat out of it so that you just get this really clean, super smooth hit. And that's what it does. That's very nice. It's a, have you ever heard of a um, an incredible? They um, yeah, right at the beginning of legalization, right when the industry was happening, when I was still bud tending, when I was in college at a dispensary before um there was even regulation <laughs> for for sales wow. um a friend of mine was the inventor of a of a pipe um that was called the incredible and what was really interesting about it is it was a hollow chamber that was connected to a, a pipe and it would secure around your mouth and you would hit it and all the smoke would just fill in the chamber but not go into your mouth until you released the chamber and it would allow the, the carb essentially to, to throw it in. The, the is the craziest thing. There's no 
freezer. There's no glycerin. There's no cooling down. It's literally allowing the smoke to sit in a chamber for one or two seconds before being shot into your lungs that just nullifies it. And then you just take in this unbelievable thing. Anyways, we can talk wow. about more interesting things other no. than pipe. A technology. shotgun pipe. I love yeah, that. It's a shotgun, shotgun pipe. pipe. It, 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 was, it was crazy because the thing worked so damn well and they were like indestructible, but back in the day memories. Thanks for bringing that back. Oh God, yeah, I love that stuff. So now you, you were talking about being a bud tender. How did you get started in this industry? You started early, right? Oh yeah, I'm, pff, shit. I mean, I was selling, I, mean, I was buying and smoking cannabis every day in middle school. Um, and I, I was doing it because my, uh, everyone was telling me not to. Um, <laughs> I, I didn't, I had no expectation that my world would get uh, enamored at, at that level because um, two, two really, really, really crazy things happened to me. One, I learned uh, self-alchemy is possible. You can put yourself in a magical world and understand ideologies and technologies from an entirely different um, conscious construct by choosing to alchemically change yourself for that reason. And cannabis was just such an incredible way to show me how the world of magic um, from a pretty young age and, uh, and how possible things were outside of the world that I only knew to be true from, from a singular perspective. Um, and then besides that, I realized how medically beneficial it was uh, in conjunction to all the other uh, pharmaceuticals, pharmaceuticals and crap I was taking as a kid that you just really didn't need to because cannabis worked um, instead. So, so who are you scoring yeah, I got, buds I got from? started early. <clears throat> who are you scoring buds from at that age? Oh, the bad kids on the block uh, who went to the bad schools. And the weed we were buying from them was swag. Shitty, hella whack-ass grass, Mexican cartel brick pack, seeds and stems, shit that we haven't seen in a long time. And, and it's what we were telling the legislators is like, you want to end like cartel money and and how 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 big you're allowing them to to be in profit and profit and the power that you give them by making cannabis against the law right we're like watch this make cannabis legal and and just see what happens and since then good luck finding mexican brick pack in the state of colorado yeah this far i mean good luck i mean seriously it's it's funny to even think about right like it just doesn't even make sense um and that's the truth it, it's exactly what happened it's a, yeah. And like, so by the time you're a teenager, you were already a, an advocate. You were already protesting and speaking up for the man. Yes. Um, and I, to be clear, I was born at the right age, at the right time, in the right city, and I got to meet the right people um, all, all, all at once, right? Because the guys, most people still don't know who's responsible for legalizing weed. There are a very small handful of people who actually did it. Now there's thousands of people who have helped. There are more groups and organizations that have been trying since the 1970s. So we're not discrediting anything, but um, the guys who actually wrote the bill and got it to pass, um, I'm lucky enough to call them my friends. And I started protesting with them uh, when I was in high school in the streets of Denver, Colorado. Um, and their nonprofit organizations have now turned into uh, the largest cannabis uh, legal consult there is in the world. Uh, and that's, uh, you know, um, Brian Vicente, Christian Cedarberg, uh, VS, Vicente Cedarberg, uh, those guys. So um, yeah, I got started young, but I mean, you know, if I was born in Utah or Wyoming or Texas, yeah. you know, it's a big difference from being on ground zero, Denver, Colorado in the, uh, you know, the early 2000s. <clears throat> right. What, what happened to you at what point that took you from being a normal, you know, consumer slash bud tender that took you to that next level 
to get you to the point where you're starting to think about, I'm going to create the Tricom Institute? Um, two things, passion and being pissed off, mm. which are kind of interchangeable. Um, I'm so passionate about how real cannabis is, how safe it is, how much it really can help people, um, and how wrong it is that it was taken from us in the way that it was and why. I am intimately passionate about that. And then I got pissed off <laughs> when I saw uh, how the cannabis industry uh, started to do its thing uh, because I was told to stop educating our patients, the guys who were serious medical patients, our MS patients or our war veterans, people who were coming in for not just weed, but to learn how do I use this as a medicine? What do I do? <laughs> uh, and I was passionate about helping them. And I was told to shut up and to get them out the door, sell them a sack of weed and move on to the next customer because we got to line up the door. Mm -hmm. And that it was more about business um, than it was about caring for people. Um, and, and then I was just so confused why the majority of things people were saying in the dispensary were just so obviously wrong. Like the idea that out of thousands of these domesticated hybrid plant types, there's only two kinds, indica or sativa. I'm like, yeah, that doesn't even make sense. How, like, <laughs> how does that even like, who's just okay with that? And like, that's as far as your thought process goes, that doesn't help people, especially when the indica and sativa aren't what people think they are, or they're the opposite. I'm like, well, so what is going on here? I mean, cannabis is a big deal. It deserves a little bit of sincerity does it not so why are we taking sincere people and telling them bogus things and sending them out the door on their way after getting 50 bucks and moving on to the next one i'm like there, there's something here that's missing and it's called giving a shit and the, and the way that i know how to give a shit the most is to um is to is is really education and information I care that this person is going to access the best medicine in the best way based on knowing what the medicine is and how it works and how they should use it. It, it is that basic. It, it really is just kind of that easy. But there's nothing easy about cannabis. Nothing. And so it's hard to get bored from something that is constantly challenging you, but also teaching you things about culture, law, policy, activism, horticulture, science, chemistry, medicine, business, product development, marketing. I mean, dude, I've gotten a world, a, a really well-rounded education on so many things in the world by just um, sticking with cannabis um, and, and at a deep level. And so it's, it's hard not to get a lot out of it. Yeah. You know, um, I don't think there's a show that I've done since I started this where your name hasn't come up at <laughs> one point or another or the Tricom Institute. Um, I've told the story to many people. I don't think I've ever told it to you, uh, to your face. Um, but you're aware of this, uh, you know, we connected. Uh, I reached out to you uh, about a week and a half, almost two weeks into writing my book about the connoisseur's guide to the Amsterdam coffee shops. Yep. Um, I considered myself at that moment to be a cannabis expert. And I had, you know, participated in dozens and dozens and dozens of cannabis cups all around the world. I had sampled the very best and had the very best buds that you could possibly see everywhere. And here I was now writing a book in this format that was much like the Michelin uh, restaurant guy where I was doing the exact same thing in every place. And it was the very first time that I was going to these coffee shops side by side by side by side by side by side by side and documenting it. It's a very different thing than when you're just trolloping around doing cannabis cups and going to one place and getting all, it was very different. All of a sudden, I found myself completely lost, confused, didn't I, I'm going, what the hell? I thought I knew what I was talking about. 
and you were one of the phone calls I made. And you took my call. You spent about 30, I, I don't know if you remember this phone call because you've talked to so many. You spent about 30 minutes with me on the phone. You were very, very kind. I told you exactly what was going on. And you taught me how to smell a bud properly on the phone um, right then and said, stop thinking about the strain names at all. Just throw those out completely and start smelling the buds. And then you'll know what you're actually, and that was it. And take my class. <laughs> <laughs> and that day, that night, I signed up for my interpreting class and, uh, and continued on. And from that point on, the names didn't mean anything to me, no matter what they said. But I made a note of the ones that were completely out of whack. You know, if, uh, if it was, they said it was a cushion, it was a haze, then, you know, it was like, come on, let's make some effort here. But they didn't even know, you know, that was the thing. So again, you filled in a block. I, I said today, it was like, I had a bridge. I feel like I had a bridge that was like this and, you know, it needed one more block in the center to really make the bridge. You filled in that bridge for me. So again, once again, thank you so much. Now I, what this? Ah, look at that. So How in, cool the, is that? in the most recent edition of interpreting, um, I wanted to pay homage to books that mention interpreting in their book. And after your book came out with it, Captain Hooters Connoisseur Guide to Amsterdam Coffee Shops. How you cool. are in interpreting uh, because of your passion, because you give a shit yeah. <laughs> a lot about cannabis. Yeah. So yeah. that's, that's what matters here is, is connecting with people who, who care at the level we do. So thanks for doing what you do, Captain. Um, Thank I you. Gotta... Well, and, and I had a couple of questions now. Here was, here was a funny question that I was talking to another interpreter the other day. I don't know if you've watched the, the worldwide bud reports that we've been doing afterwards. We have several interpreters who are doing some of the bud reports and they've been just fantastic. And one of the questions that came up was um, the term interpreter. Um, how did you come about that name? And uh, secondly, did you ever consider something like bud whisperer or a weed wizard? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Bud, bud wizard would have, or bud whisperer would have been cool. Yeah. So um, I'm, this, uh, I do have a good answer for you. <laughs> I, um, I, I don't know if I tell many people this and I don't know how much I should say this, but I'll, I'll just say that okay. uh, when I was writing, interpreting and putting it together, um, I was currently in trouble with the law at the time. So I had uh, some serious time on my hands at home. Um, and and I got to just have the time to sit down and, and really put together, how would you teach the world how to overcome the biggest problems with cannabis, which are this, the inaccuracy of these strain names, these strains, these variety types, they're all indica and sativa. It's just like, how, do you, how would you teach someone how to fix that? And the approach is you know, because every cannabis expert I've ever met doesn't know too much about cannabis, the plant. And I, I'm not saying that to be mean uh, or facetious. Actually, ask anyone who claims they're a cannabis expert how many trichomes the plant has and what they are and what their differences are. They don't know. Most cannabis experts don't know uh, with the technical name of the little pistols that we call hair. Um, a lot of cannabis experts just don't really know the, the, the real technicalities of cannabis and I know be, from my cousin being a sommelier that, um, that these guys are above expert level and that they're above connoisseurship. These are songs. <laughs> they know what they know about wine and viticulture is, is freakish. It's so much more than just an expertise. It's, it's a freakish understanding and an intimacy with this with this thing that they are truly in love with and really really understand um, at, at a really deep level so I needed to go in that direction so how do you make a cannabis sommelier right and you know I started researching there's such a thing as a beer sommelier they're called cicerone mm -hmm. there's such a thing as a coffee sommelier what they do is considered cupping um, there are tobaccoists, cheesemongers, all of these things. 
Um, and so I did play with the name uh, Can a Song. Uh, you know, and I can't con a, can a sore, right? That's one that a lot of people. So mixing, you know, cannabis, pop, 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 pop. The cupping doesn't have the word coffee in it. Monger doesn't have the word cheese in it. Cicerone doesn't have the word beer in it. Sommelier doesn't have the word wine in it. These are particular names for these expertise. Okay, oh. great. So how do you apply that to cannabis? Well, and I just asked myself, stop just trying to make up just make something up let's just be real here what are we doing yeah well we are interpreting terpenes is what we're doing when i teach you to just smell the flower you're not interpreting terpenes by smelling them with your first cranial nerve i mean you are but you're also interpreting interpreting them in a different way in a more in-depth way which is with your fifth cranial nerve your trigeminal nerve you're you are interpreting terpenes in a variety of different ways at an expert level because you're intimate with the flower to understand what it's offering you from a sommelier approach and so just to be really real i think what we're doing here is we're we're interpreting terpenes we're we're interpreting is what we're doing and i and i just think it makes sense that somebody who does interpreting is probably an interpreter um it might be more fun to consider us interpenators. Uh, I don't know, but sometimes the word interpreter turns me off. I'm like, man, I wish there was something a little sexier than interpreter. Like, no, I like that. that. <laughs> <laughs> the interpenator. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but anyways, that's, that's where it comes from. That's, that's the thought process. <clears throat> that's awesome. Okay. So I, one of my other questions I wanted to ask you is, and probably when I, when I try to explain interpreting to people and I start going into some detail, it's usually right about this point that uh, I start getting uh, the, the cross-eyed looks. <clears throat> I'll start talking to them about uh, sativa and indica. And I'll tell them, what if I tell you that sativa is not sativa? It's indica subspecies, subgenome, uh, indica and that indica is indica subspecies afghanica and then yeah. i start crossing right there yeah. can 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 you now take over my conversation put your hand around that guy and go let me explain it to you okay great i will so <clears throat> for the past 300 years there has been a debate specifically in cannabis speciation one of the biggest aspects of this debate is if these plants are monotypic or polytypic, meaning there's only one species with multiple subspecies and then variety types, or there's multiple species with, that have their own subspecies and then variety types. Um, it's true that the vast majority of researchers for the longest periods, including uh, Rob Clark of the Cannabis Evolution and Ethnobotany textbook that tries to answer this question specifically in a textbook that is this thick. <laughs> um, and, and they landed on the fact that cannabis has multiple species, all these things. Okay. At the end of the day, the very most recent research that's come out uh, suggests that cannabis is in fact monotypic, not polytypic. There is only one species. They all come from sativa and anything from that would be a subspecies. Regardless, the confusion that you're talking about still applies, right? The idea that non-cannabis non -cannabis scientists, but cannabis black market horticulturalists there's two that are the most famous since the 19, early 1980s that everybody knows that taught everyone how to grow weed were the guys that used some reporting from other science that tried to simplify that if any plant has a narrow leaf, it's the sativa one. It's just not true. And that any plant that has the broad leaf is the indica one. And, and that that's not true because the truth is there are broad leaf uh, indica afghanica varieties and there are narrow leaf indica varieties 
That's the truth. Cannabis has this massive spectrum between narrow leaf types and broad leaf types that are both hemp or marijuana and even outside of hemp and marijuana. So at the end of the day, um, our new chapter in, in, in the new interpreting book that covers this not only explains this in the way that I did, but at the end of the day, what we explain is none of this matters at all because nothing that you're working with is an indica or sativa to begin with. They're so, 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 so far removed from these indigenous plant types in exotic geographies from so freaking long ago that it's irrelevant. Why you're debating so much about speciation on the opposite side of the planet a couple hundred years ago is my question. Why are you, why is that so important for you? And it's because people are stuck in, in that misinformation loop that we should be talking about these plants as if they're into curiosity, but when in reality we shouldn't be because they're not anymore. Mm -hmm. Right. And so my analogy is, it has always been um, that yes, my French bulldogs do descend from gray wolves. They, as crazy as that might seem, that's true. It would be as ridiculous for me to talk about my French bulldogs as if they were gray wolves today because of how far removed they are. Mm -hmm. They are domesticated hybrid. They are something different, but they are dogs. Just stop talking about the gray wolf because it doesn't matter. Just talk about the differences between bulldog varieties because that's what we've got today. Um, and that's why we um, really changed, you know, the, the old weed wheel used to say indica and sativa on it. And now it's, it says broadleaf marijuana or narrow leaf marijuana. And that's because we um, have an ideology that because these plants aren't indica or sativa, drop that entirely and move forward with where the rest of the world is currently taking this, which is these simplified acronyms. It's hard to say that that plant right there is not a broadleaf marijuana type if what you're looking at is a cannabis plant that has broad leaves and gets high. Right. Well, it's a broad, it's a, it's a BLM. It's a broadleaf marijuana type. Just make it easy. It seems it seems so simple and yet and yet. Yeah. You know, uh, a couple of different things. I had uh, uh, Brandon on and uh, we got a chance to talk about his cooking with cannabis course, um, mm -hmm. which I'm still in the middle of, which I absolutely love. And he is a, a very important part of Tricom Institute and uh, the mm -hmm. interpreting program as well. Can you talk about how you guys first got together? Um, yeah. Yep. I... Um... Brandon as somebody who definitely gives a shit, right? Uh, he came to my interpreting course when I was teaching him in, uh, live still before we did online courses and all that stuff. Um, and he took my class and I, I actually think I, uh, he, he didn't pass. And I think he was so um, adamant about passing that he, uh, you know, stayed the next day and, um, came back to my office and wanted to retest and he did and he passed. Um, and, and, you know, that was, that was that mm -hmm. until I think like six or nine months after the fact, um, I was in San Diego, uh, doing some event and, uh, he saw that I was in town. He hit me up. He told me to come check out what he was doing. And at the time he was doing something for candescent flower out of California. And, essentially he was resharing a lot of the information that I shared with him in a very similar way okay. to a point where I was like, you're kind of doing my thing, man, <laughs> but you're doing it well, really well. I like what you're doing. So why don't we do it together? Why, you know, I need somebody to, who, who gives a shit and gets it 
as much as you do to uh, to be a part of 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 pushing it forward. Um, and you know, Brandon um, and I are are very similar in a lot of um, uh, what would you call it? personality ways. Our personalities are actually unfortunately very similar. Um, but where we differ is, you know, he is not an ADD dyslexic stoner the way that I am. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and so, you know, the way that he works versus the way that I work, uh, they do work well together when we, um, when we get a big cup of coffee and sit down and, and work together on things. Mm-hmm. So um, that's kind of how that, that, that worked out. Mm. That's awesome. You know, there's um, uh, the other classes you have, we have extractions and concentrates. We have the cooking with the uh, uh, cannabis and the dispensary training. Um, uh, all of those classes uh, I, I've either finished or I've, I've went through and they've all been fantastic. And there's tools that go along with, uh, with the uh, uh, Tricom Institute as well. Uh, I was just showing a second ago, the, the weed wheel, which is uh, one of the great toys, and there's an interpreting loop, uh, which also has a ton of information. And one of my favorites is the uh, the terpene kit. Abstracts. Abstracts. And um, I, I've, I've talked about them quite a bit, and I wanted to get some feedback from you on how, you know, that all came together. And side note, my wife wants to take the Jack Herrera uh, aroma and turn it into an aftershave. Mm-hmm. Thinks it's fantastic, loves it. That's your next uh, product. Um, I mean, obviously, our our next product is the um, the advanced course, which I can definitely talk about and explain um, oh. some of the reasoning why it's uh, not come out as as soon as it really should have. Um, but you know. Um, we could continue to develop products, but from a business perspective, we have to get over our internet black cloud. We're not allowed to advertise on any Google platform, Facebook platform, uh, Instagram doesn't allow us to promote ourselves, boost anything. They shut our account down a couple of weeks ago uh, where we had to fight to get it back. So we, we need to focus on letting the world know that we exist so that we can, you know, keep up what we're doing instead of continuously just building another product or another thing or another course. Um, so there is a really serious business need and a business issue that we have been trying to solve because um, the world of advertising treats us the same way that they treat dispensaries because they know that we're a cannabis business. And so because there are legitimate reasons why they can't um, service dispensaries, we don't fall in the same category because we're educators, we're unlicensed, we don't touch the product, but they don't care because they don't see it that way. And they want to cover their own ass and not risk, not risk an underage person on Instagram being offered illegal drug substances from a company that they assume that's what we're doing because we're a cannabis company. So, right. So there are bigger fish to fry and problems to solve that people, our customers and our fans just don't really experience Mm -hmm. uh, on the front end. So there's a lot going on there. So from a business perspective, there's there's a lot of focus. Mm -hmm. Um, Simultaneously, when things do change over time, we do update them. Uh, for instance, you know, the I showed you the interpreting book, which is updated, but I need to send you. Um, send me an email reminder because I need to send you uh, the new book with the new tools. I believe you have this version of the weed wheel, which is great, but um, there's been a couple changes to it where um, if you see this one, Mm -hmm. this uh, this one has a little leaf on the bottom, a better description. Uh, We cleaned up some of the information here. It's it's been updated slightly. Oh, cool. Okay. Um, and, you know, other things like the interpreting loop, mm-hmm. when we decided that interpreting is really kind of a post growing thing, even though you can interpret plants based off structure and leaf shape and other things that apply to interpreting methodology, um, that it might make more sense to show the flowers more uh, awesome. on top. And so 
there, so you can see just like some slight iterations where our process is continuously getting tighter and better and, and, and moving forward in all those ways. So we, and that includes the uh, aromatic training kit. If, I, if I'm teaching you online how to be intimate with smells that you feel in different parts of your face, but you live in North Carolina and there's no access to weed and you don't have a dispensary, it's not medical and the shit you get on the street isn't good enough. Um, how am I supposed to be teaching you these things online? And that was, you know, the real need for there being a, an interpreting training kit to teach people how to feel terpenes or aroma in different parts of their face. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's a great product because it, it, oh. it actually works. I just, you know, what we need to do is um, maybe you and I, Captain, will offer a free uh, Eventbrite um, event to teach people how to interact with and use their interpreting training kit. Because oh, yes. one of the things that we need to uh, focus on more is just connecting with the community more mm -hmm. and figuring out how to do that while we are as barred on the internet <laughs> as we are yeah. um, and, and all that jazz. And you can tell I'm, I'm actually not in my office or working from home. I'm in the coffee shop down the down the way because my my internet uh, now that I live in the woods of Oregon is so awful. So it's all just trying to figure it out and make it work. But um, it's just a process. That's awesome. Okay. Well, number one, yes, on definitely on doing the uh, uh, doing a class on on using the kit better. I, I have been using it because as I have gotten older, I have I've I've realized that I'm losing a, my sense of smell a little bit and I'm losing my sense of taste. I'm not able to differentiate to the way that I used to be able to. And what I've been doing it is been closing my eyes and smelling them and trying to recognize. And so that I'm kind of training, you know, it's just like doing setups to me. And, uh, you know, and then I see someone like Herb Green, uh, one of our interpreters that does the bud reports, and he has a miraculous nose. You know, he has one, he has a true sommelier's nose. And he's talking, he's pulling things out and he's going, I'm getting a sub essence of, you know, a uh, 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 chestnut. And, uh, you know, I'm going, oh God, you know, I, I've got to get my game going here. And I love it. And the other thing about that kit, it is one of the greatest conversation openers in a, a group. You come out and whip out that, that bottle of uh, uh, real Jack Herrera and open that conversation with that, it, it was phenomenal. I used it heavily at Spanibus. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, you know, I am really good friends with Jack's son. Uh, we hang out, we talk, we, we were just in Texas not too long ago. We got to shoot a bunch of guns together at a, at a range. Um, yeah, like he's, he's, he's a good friend of mine. I'm gonna see him in two weeks. I'm All right. A, I'm well, a, let me yeah. prepare you. Let me prepare you. He will chew you out if you say his name wrong and the industry says his name wrong. And I'm guilty of it myself. I thought uh -oh. it was Jack Herrera. I did too. It, he, if you get this right the first time, he might just give you a kiss on the cheek because he is adamant about this. As okay, he should. Cool. It's pronounced hair. 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 Terror like terror. So be terrified every time you see Dan that he's going to chew you out for saying his name wrong. Be Feel the terror and, and know the terror. So when you see Dan, you can say, it's Dan, what's up, Dan, Dan hair. Hair? <laughs> and that And that way you, you got it right. And so, but the, 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 the industry got, doesn't, you know, that's, this is and what I thought I was, I thought I was doing it correctly. <laughs> All this time I've been calling him Jack Herrera and it's Jack Herr. Got it. Hair, Jack. hair, yeah. hair, hair. I, listen, okay. I, I, I only, the only reason why I say it like that is because I've screwed it up so many times myself in front of him <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> that, he, that he has chewed me out for it. So it's just, it, it's comes with doing it over and over again. Uh, okay, I got to move along because I don't. I, I want to keep my time going here. Yeah, uh, seventh trichome update. What's happening oh. with seventh trichome? Ah, <laughs> uh, I'm not supposed to tell you, but because you're Captain Hooter, I'm. Uh oh. 
I'm going to spill some beans. Uh Oh, I've been told to shut up about the sudden trichome. Okay. Uh, I've been told to stop posting about it. I've been told to stop writing blog articles about it because there is so much confirmation that it actually is a new cannabis discovery. It's such a real thing that the community who's helping me prove it doesn't want someone else to get to it first. Okay, got it. Moving on. I feel, I feel, <laughs> no, no, let me, I'll, I'll give you a couple updates though. Okay, okay. One, what I just said is good news because that means it is more serious than, than yeah, it's serious. Uh, two, uh, I had a contract with the university to make this discovery and they screwed up royally. Mm. I delivered the plants to them and they thought I was lying to them that the plants were actually one plant, not the other. And they decided not to study them and take too much time. Long story short, um, it's not a secret. I can tell you that the new university that I've got the contract with to make this discovery is Texas A&M, oh. uh, one of the largest agricultural schools. And I um, am partnered with them. And there is actually a group of students who are uh, helping make this discovery. And the only thing I can tell you right now is not only are they in possession of the plants, not only are we contracted, not only are they working on it, but the seventh trichome plants are big, they're healthy, and they're about to flip in a flower. So uh, we're probably a month or two away from having a Texas A&M uh, confirmation. And, and that's when we get into the real science. So oh, electron scanning, microscopy, white papers, official discoveries, all that stuff. So it's happening. I'm excited for you, man. I think it's going to be so cool. Um, uh, Moving on to one of the things I, I actually talked to the people on my relevant app ahead of time uh, about a week ago because I was talking about you in one of my live presentations and I was telling them the story about Bunny Whaler. Hmm. And, you know, I lived in Jamaica. Uh, I've been going to Jamaica for 30 years and I've had lots of friends there for years and years and years, lived there a couple of times. And uh, this last time I was there for a year. And I developed some very strong relationships. Uh, as you know, while I was there, I wrote another book. I went to every single herb house. I did the same thing I did in Jamaica uh, that I did in Amsterdam, uh, where I went to every single herb house. I went and saw as many of the growers as I could possibly see. And after doing all of that and watching your video that you did uh, for the passing of Bunny Whaler, first of all, my wife and I both cried watching your video and I don't cry for stuff. Um, number one, uh, the amount of respect that I have for you and for the why I'm doing things with you or uh, that grew exponentially uh, from that video and from what you went through there. I have a couple of questions about how you end how you were there in the first place. And I vaguely know about something that had to do with a, some court case or a land case or something that was legal where they were using your expertise, but I'm, I'm still vague about all that. Can you tell me a little bit about that part of it? The universe works in weird ways. Um, I'm still trying to figure out how I got to Jamaica in the first place. Um, Someone from Germany sent me a one-line email that said, I heard you're the cannabis expert, are you? And I replied, yes. <laughs> and they that said, easy. yeah, and they said, cool, we're shooting a documentary. We don't know what we're filming, but we, we, you might, we might want you in it. Here's a plane ticket to Jamaica, be there by Monday. <laughs> and wow. I, I was like, um, are you going to kill me? Do I get to know who you are? Like, who's going to pick me up from the airport? What are we doing? Nothing. You've never been there before, right? I don't even know who sent me to Jamaica. I just went. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it was the weirdest thing in the world because it was uh, some European royalty who had a mansion on the island that I stayed with 
who paid for everything in this film crew and they were filming all the projects that they were doing in Jamaica. Uh, and th these people were literally the definition of evil. Um, they're, all of the Jamaican helpers were treated like actual slaves. They were yeah. passing out as they were delivering food from exhaustion, from just never being given breaks. I mean, just, oh. I mean, uh, really the toxic side of Jamaica. Mm -hmm. I was staying in and seeing um, and experiencing while I was also staying the night at Bunny Whaler's house in Trenchtown <laughs> and helping the Rastafarians um, fight the government for policy and legislation that would protect them slightly. And because I'm passionate about cannabis and the right thing to do, I was telling the government that you need to obviously have medical licensing and you obviously need to have adult con use licensing um, because this is the tourist destination for cannabis use and obviously it's going to be a big revenue generator. Here's the deal. People come to Jamaica to smoke weed because of the poor black man and his suffering. That's where Rasta music comes from. That's what a big aspect of Rastafari is. And so if you use the Lion of Judah, which is a religious symbol, if you use the colors, green, yellow, and red, if you use these songs and you use these men and you use what they look like, you're using them in their ideology for marketing purposes for what? Rich white people from the US who wanna come down here and build a dispensary with all the money they get and not give anything back to where and why this is happening in the first place? How about no? How about you also create a license for the religious, the Rastafara man, and for anybody who wants to experience cannabis through him, there's an avenue for that. That's all we were saying. <laughs> it's like, make cannabis a thing, make it in Jamaica, don't leave out the Rasta, include him, include them, include her. Um, and when I was fighting with the Rastafarians in, and I told them how, um, how Rastas and Jews, you know, both come from the same place. And we both believe in the Torah and King Solomon and how the Lion of Judah um, and Mount Zion is Israel and, and, and Jewish and all those things. And that's who I am and where I come from. We developed a brotherhood very quickly. Um, they accepted me as one of their own. They baptized me butt naked at the Holy Tabernacle uh, in a river um, with a 10 inch spliff in my hand. Yeah. Bunny Whaler baptized me himself on the side of a, of the, of a, of a rink of a of the, of the river bank, not only with Bunny Whaler and, and all the Rastafarian elders, but also with Hele Selassie of Ja Rastafari's great granddaughter, Yeshi. Yeah. Literally the granddaughter of their God, black Jesus, you know, in the living form, Hele Selassie. Uh, I was hanging out with, I mean, I was smoking blunts on the back of a minivan with Selassie's granddaughter running around Jamaican islands with, with Bunny Whaler. And um, people don't believe that shit, but I, I have all the pictures and video to prove it. I even have a oh, video yeah. baptized by them. Um, I mean, and then shit gets real crazy when, when all of a sudden Grace Jones hops in the picture. And then I saw, I was on the beach with Grace Jones and Bunny Whaler at the base of this mansion. When I saw Bunny and uh, Chris Blackwell, you know, talking together for the first time in 40 years and, and Blackwell is who stripped Bob Marley away from Bunny and why Bunny and his family are still poor and contributing to why the black poor Rasta is the black poor Rasta. Yeah. I mean, wait, I, wait, wait, wait. You, we, we got to stop there in one second, because that is that that was one of the most amazing parts of your video right there. Yeah. Okay. For anybody who's ever been to Jamaica, if you know anything about Chris Blackwell, his yeah. name is, he is, he's, he's the, you know, the, the J Edgar Hoover. Uh, he's or not the Edgar Hoover. He's the uh, uh, Howard Hughes of, of Jamaica. He has all yeah. the great resorts. He is the guy that, that did and brought, took apart uh, the whalers from Bob Marley, but the history between those two men and the fact that you were there at that precise moment and the fact that a ginger boy from 
I'm a I'm a white boy. Yeah. Is baptized in I mean that is you gotta understand is that's phenomenal. <laughs> and the videos the, of you with Bunny Whaler in his house talking about the symbology and um, the true love and care that you had for that man. I, we all feel for our, all of our friends that we have in Jamaica and, and we are right, we're right there with you all the way through. And again, major, huge, massive respect uh, for that whole thing. And again, if you haven't seen it, people, please go Google that, uh, Max Montrose. Uh, Bunny Whaler, and you'll be able to see that video. It was phenomenal. Tell me about Grace. How is she? Is she oh, cool? Dude, I watched this 70-year-old woman down a bottle of wine at breakfast, take off her clothes, and jump into the ocean butt naked. Like, she was a, like she was a fucking little kid. <laughs> Another. I mean, I mean, smoking weed in a mansion, hanging out with, with Grace Jones. I don't know, man. Blessed, uh, blessed man. <laughs> you are blessed, man. Yeah, I mean, Grace Jones is a trip. I mean, I literally got to, I mean, I got, to, I spent the night at a mansion with her for a, a handful of nights. Mm -hmm. I got to I got to smoke and drink and party with Grace Jones. I got I got a picture of only of Bunny Whaler with Chris Blackwell, me and Grace Jones. This is the only how the hell I ended up in that photo. How does it how does <laughs> Yeah. There's a reason for everything, you know? I don't know, there, man. There's a cycle for it. You know, I'm gonna take you down one of the rabbit holes. Uh, you were talking about being there with Emperor Hale Selassie. King of Kings, his granddaughter. And, yeah. you know, his mother and father were the Queen of Sheba and uh, King Solomon, correct? That's correct. And so the story, yeah, They're descended, descendant. right. So the story, there's, there's a story that goes along with all of this. And you know where I'm going that ultimately leads us to the conversation of the Ark of the Covenant. Oh, so, man. I know. <laughs> now, there was, there was another story that just came out, I read two days ago. And I knew I was going to, to have a chance to chat with you about it. So uh, they, they were saying that it, they think it's in Ethiopia mm -hmm. was uh, the, the story that I think ultimately was the end of that article. So where do you think the Ark is? And what kind of killer buds do you think are inside that Ark? <laughs> and are they smokable? Do you think they used Bavita packets back in those days? <laughs> um, well, we can't tell you what's inside the ark, but we can tell you what the result of being near it is, which is death. Um, you die when you get near it because of how radioactive it is. Um, that's how it was used by um, Jerusalem soldiers as a religious weapon in more than one instance. Um, and yes, the Ark of the Covenant was stolen most likely by um, teams of people who were politically against King Solomon um, at the time of him being the king of the Jews in Jerusalem. And um, we do know that King Solomon um, hooked up with the Queen of Sheba from Africa and that they had Black children who uh, became royalty um, in the empire of Ethiopia who are the direct descendants uh, that led to the last living empire of Ethiopia, which was Hele Selassie. Right. Um, and so, uh, I'm, let's see. Um, I'm trying to, it's right on the tip of my, tip of my brain. Uh, the author who's done the most work on this subject, um, I have Indiana his Jones. <laughs> well, this is the reason why Indiana Jones is real. Most people <laughs> don't know that uh, when they watch Indiana Jones and he's like on a search for the Ark of the Covenant and he's fighting Nazis from Germany in North Africa, that that's something that actually happened. Um, <laughs> and that Indiana Jones is, cool. is, is as real as Harry Potter and uh, Star Wars. But those are things for different conversations, but things <laughs> that I actually am quite intimately involved with. 
um, it's, God, what is his name? There's an author that has done all the research on this and he is um, the foreword of a book that I'm very, a big fan of right now, The Immortality Key, which explains how the Christian religion um, started on the use of entheogens um, and doing magic and um, sacred medicine. Uh, and I've somehow become really good friends with that author. And so I'm kind of in that little inner circle. Long story short, yes, I personally believe that the Ark of the Covenant was moved to Ethiopia based on all the research that I've done. And I don't know, there's a lot I could say about this, but um, I also don't want to bore any, any people yeah. who are so far removed from this esotericism that, you know, they just want to know more about weed. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, I was going to take you in another direction. I was going to take you over into your technical and shamanic work with psychedelics, which mm -hmm. I'm very excited about. Since you moved to Oregon, you have just been on a little uh, psychedelic rampage, and it's been quite wonderful to follow. So, to, to give us the scoop, what, what's, uh, what have you been doing? Well, psychedelics are legal here, um, and I don't think they're legal anywhere else in the United States. Um, you have decriminalization laws in uh, multiple cities uh, in California. You've got decrim for psilocybin in Denver. Um, you've got decrim for varieties of entheogens and or particular psychedelics in a variety of cities and places in the US right now. Um, regulation is happening, um, re-regulation, uh, medicalization, um, lots of, lots, there's lots of things happening in that space. Uh, currently, Oregon is the only place where uh, it's not only decriminalized to be in possession of things like, you know, San Pedro or peyote or mushrooms, um, it's legal. I can legally have them on me. And so because I am who I am and I do what I do, um, and I could not buy a house in California, Colorado, or any of those other places during the COVID shenanery, um, Oregon just kind of lined up in a variety of ways. There's lots happening out here, uh, things I agree with, things I don't agree with. Um, at the end of the day, you know, uh, we are working on a, a variety of psychedelic projects. Uh, my specialty, is, for people who don't know, is um, psychedelic cacti variety types from around the world, um, and also uh, psychoactive cacti varieties from around the world. Um, I really like exploring the more rare psychedelics, and so uh, 5-MeO-DMT from the toad, um, little sub-alkaloids from different cacti varieties that are not necessarily mescaline, but um, are really powerful in, in different ways. And what is that? And what are they? And how do those things work? Um, as well as Ibogaine, Tabernanthi Bulga, um, which I've had a really bizarre experience with as well. Um, those are the things that I'm most interested in, you know, so the kind of psychedelics people don't work with. There's a lot of acid, there's a lot of mushrooms, there's a lot of DMT, there's a lot of San Pedro, cool. Um, I like the more weirder, more wild, more esoteric things. Um, mm -hmm. And then what I'm currently interested in and also working on is um, researching how entheogens have been used in esoteric um, societies for thousands of years. So what plants were the ancient Egyptians using when they were conducting ceremony to kill themselves consciously to pass over the event horizon to learn about the world of the dead and come back to talk about it. Ooh. Well, we, we access that kind of stuff. We do that kind of stuff today. Uh, and so what would it look like to create ceremony uh, with those plant medicines in those particular ways with esoteric uh, and learned individuals who are worthy of an experience like this. So um, it's very possible that if you're someone who has gone through uh, a lot of degree work <laughs> um, or are a part of a mystery school of, of uh, certain kinds, um, that 
in the future, you may be able to come to Oregon and uh, experience one of these um, truly religious events that we're creating. That sounds awesome, dude. Um, I had an interesting conversation. Uh, I think you know, you know, you've heard of Soma, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Soma Seeds in, in Amsterdam. Uh, when I first moved there, I had, I heard this crazy rumor. And one of the rumors was that, you know, he was uh, a, a, an older quote unquote psychonaut who took lots of mushrooms, acid, DMT all the time. And that uh, one of his secrets was the fact that he used to urinate on his, on his plants because he had all of this in his system. It was having an effect on the plants. Now, I didn't know if that was even possible or not. And I, of course, you know, after living there for five or six years and then having an opportunity to interview him, you know, I asked him, I said, so are, do you trip and pee on your plants? And, you know, and he says, no, 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 no. What I did do, though, is I did create a, an ayahuasca tea and was able to use the tea to water the plants. Mm -hmm. Have you had any experience with this? Have you ever heard of doing something like this? Is, is it intriguing to you? Is it something that <laughs> now you got to go do some experimenting on? Um, yes and no. Um, I have the most experience with uh, women using their period blood to water their plants with. Um, my first experience was that is I was smoking a joint with the, uh, the CEO of, uh, the Foria, the sex lube, THC, CBD, uh, company. Okay. Yeah. And I was, uh, I was spending the night at his house. Um, and, uh, yeah, his, his wife, who's just the most darling thing ever. I'm like rolling the split. I'm like smoking. And she's like, yeah, and I, I watered that one with like, only my period blood. I'm like, really? <laughs> uh, all right. Um, there's a lot of iron um, in that. There's a lot of vitamins. There's a lot of nutrients. And there's some life force energy that uh, may contribute um, powerful things to those plants that from a horticulture level probably actually does make a lot of sense. So as bizarre as it might be for the Western world to consider those types of things, there, there might be some legit reasons for it. Now, what value would a plant get from drinking ayahuasca, right? Which is a very, very, very thick, thick, thick drink. Have you ever drank it? No, no, never had. I've had ayahuasca uh, about 12 times now in my life. And it is, uh, it tastes kind of like thick, semi-sweet, uh, semi-rotten uh, or spoiled chocolate milk. So if you can imagine chocolate milk, that's a little bit gross, but still a little bit sweet and mm -hmm. enough to get down is what it tastes like. What is it? I mean, it is just boiled uh, plant matter uh, from one or a variety of different DMT complaining, com containing plants and Banisteriopsis capi, the vine, uh, also called ayahuasca, which is an MAOI inhibitor. Mm -hmm. um, it is a thick, thick, thick drink that's made from leaves and plants that's loaded with tryptamines and MAOI inhibitors. I don't know that the plants would uh, uptake it at all. Mm -hmm. I don't know that they would get value from it. I do see after taking ayahuasca and knowing how unbelievably magical of a substance it is wanting to give that life force energy to your plants and somehow get the vibration of grandmother medicine into your plant by feeding it to your plant. And I, I can, I, you know, it doesn't surprise me that someone would want to try that and do that. And, um, and what I don't know is if, if it does anything or not. Yeah. So, yeah. um, yeah, interesting. Fascinating. That's all I thought too. It's one of those things like, and finally something different, um, unique and unusual. Uh, two more questions about uh, Oregon. One, uh, how is your uh, greenhouse going? I know you were working on building it. Yeah, I am. I, um, yeah, I turned a dilapidated shack that 
I probably should have knocked down. I just reframed it and I made half of it into a bird house. Uh, I've got my chickens in there right now and I've got some peacocks in the incubator and the other half of the greenhouse currently is loaded with psychedelic cacti um, and uh, is going well. Um, and now I've got, now I've got my grow tent in the garage with my experimental uh, LED lights that are really, really, really crazy. Uh, they're not available commercially. Um, I'm a Ooh. tester for these products. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm finally starting to get my life together after COVID and out of state move, buying my first home. Man, it has been, <laughs> yeah. it's been, You've it's been, busy. been a journey the past couple of years, to say the and, least. And you ran into the, the love of your life. Uh, how is Kyle? That's Kyle, all. sweet little Kyle. She's good. She yeah. is good. Yeah. Um, I'm very happy to have her in our dogs and our partnership in our birds. I, I really hope that these little baby peacocks hatch because you because you need to come over and let me feed you a psychedelic cactus and then yes. go on a yeah. go on a hike with Kyle and I, which includes mushroom hunting in a rainforest that we're very um, where we know quite a bit about. And uh, when you're just exhausted and tired and you come back to the house, we just want gigantic, psychedelic, colorful birds to just lay in the grass with you. So we're going to, we're pairing peacocks and mescaline as, uh, as tea time options at, at the, at the Montrose home over here in Oregon. <laughs> well, I, I, you know, I think I, I mentioned on uh, one of your uh, uh, social media posts that uh, I was fortunate enough to grow up around peacocks uh, while I was growing up. You know, during a, a stage of my life, I, 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 you don't know this, but my father was a very high end cocaine dealer and oh. he, you know, he raised himself from, you know, nothing all the way to living on Frank Sinatra Drive and Rancho Mirage right down the street from Frank Sinatra. And he had all the goodies, you know, he had all the toys and he had a be beautiful uh, tennis court and built a custom made peacock uh, pen. And wow. for about uh, seven months of, of uh, eight months, almost a year, I would say almost a year, we had those peacocks and they were fabulous. They yeah. are the, the sound of them, uh, the joy of watching them is phenomenal. However, I'm going to, I am now terribly scarred because, you know, we lived in the desert and, you know, where there's desert, there are also coyotes. And, uh, you know, I, we, we, we came back to a, uh, you know, godfather, uh, ask type of uh, scenario with the with the peacocks um, uh, more than once. Unfortunately, uh, he tried to to patch up little holes in the the pen. So that that's my tip to you: security, security. I don't know what kind of predators you have there, but you know those peacocks. They look good and they sound good. I'm sure they taste good too. Because we, <laughs> we have we uh, have skunks, raccoons, weasels, red fox, gray fox, coyote, black bear, cougar, uh -oh. eagles, hawks. <laughs> you know, the, the reason for the peacocks is because they, they fight off the majority of um, the smaller predators. Uh, and they really actually do a quite good job of scaring off the bigger predators. Um, my pen is got two different types and layers of uh, secured wiring over it. And I've even yeah. uh, got wiring on the bottom of the floor that I buried. So <laughs> even for weasels and skunks that want to burrow underground and try to come up uh, into the coop, they can't. Um, yeah. And uh, we actually, um, the little solar lights that you put out in your yard that charge up all day and at night just glow different colors, greens and yellows and blues. We're surrounding the birdhouse with those at no. night. And so uh, we're, we're working on our security, but um, yeah, yeah. I, I love that anytime I post about the fact that I'm about to raise peacocks, the amount of people that comment back, they're like, man, those are the loudest, grossest, nastiest meanest birds why would you ever want this it's like yeah you mean the people who don't raise them with love yeah. the people who don't put the chicks in their pocket and take them to the grocery store with them and kiss them all day long and it just we love them the yeah we if you them. just love the crap out of the little chicks 
these are not mean birds. They're really, really, really friendly. And used to come eat out of our hands all the time. Yeah, and, and I mean, totally cool. I mean, listen, I, I raised a six foot emu, six <laughs> to seven foot tall emu from the size of a chick in, in, in the suburban backyard of my parents' house. So, and that's with Chinese cockfighting pheasants. And I had pigeon, exotic pigeons from around the world who used to show at the stock show. I, I don't think people know me well enough. It's like peacocks, really? That's it? Like, it's, it's, it's not too bad. <laughs> We've got a couple of questions from a couple of the other interpreters uh, that were here. One of them, uh, we were talking about, uh, we were, there was three of us at one point that was here, and we were discussing the Tricom Institute TAG program. Mm -hmm. Can you explain what the TAG program is for everyone else and how it's supposed to work? TAG is the, in, is the professional business side of how you actually would do interpreting, right? So as an interpreter, you know what it is, you know how to do it, and you use it for you, yourself, your friends, your family, um, and you generally do it on the fly, in the moment, while you're buying herbs, seeing herb, all of those things. So interpreting is an in-the-moment thing. Um, it's a knowledge-based thing. It's fun. It's helpful. It's interpreting. Because the cannabis industry still uses indica and sativa, strain names, which are false, and there is no quality assertion when they do COAs, certificate of analysis, they're not analyzing things for human consumption. So, you know, it was built primarily for grading cannabis cups. How would you judge cannabis the way that an interpreter would, not some OG high times version where you literally are sitting around smoking flower after flower, just kind of guessing which one you like more while you're really intoxicated. It's like, right. uh, it's just, it doesn't work. Um, <clears throat> so the tag program could be used for a variety of different things. In the past year or so, we have had partners, science projects, the thing that we've been trying to work on. And one of the reasons why the advanced course uh, has taken so long is because what we know to be true went from a tag perspective um, still needs a lot of evidence, right? And so when we tell people that there is such a thing as trichome ripeness, well, says who from the world of science? Because there's a lot of famous cannabis educators out there that um, say things that are different than what we say. We know why they're not true, um, but has the science been done and is it published enough to make sense and to, to all those things? So um, at the end of the day, what's happening is uh, now that COVID's over, now that people can get back together, now that I finally have moved and I'm settling down and have my house, now that we're working on other aspects of the business and all of these other things, what makes the most sense is to provide the TAG program as the crux of what the advanced program is. So how would you be more advanced in interpreting? By becoming proficient in the specific grading methodology for each and every particular thing that you're analyzing from an interpreting perspective. So are we interpreting quality? Yes. What does quality mean? What part of the plant are we talking about? Trichome quality, smokeability quality, how flushed are they? Um, there's all of these different aspects that are taking interpreting to just more of a professional level. So at the end of the day, an advanced interpreter could <clears throat> apply their skills in a real world business scenario. You could be an in-house um, cannabis grader for a huge MSO. So if you have a multi-state operator that's about to buy a hundred pounds of flour that you're about to put on your menu and you wanted to stop using Indica or Sativa because you're a dispensary operation that wants to do things the right way and differentiate yourself and move in a forward direction, you could hire someone who's trained and certified in, tell, in providing what the quality of that, those 100 pounds is and should be for your consumers, right? Like what's the grade of this drug before I put it in my body? And when I put it in my body, what's it gonna do to me? Not based off of a strain name, not based off of Indica or Sativa. And because there isn't uh, available chemical analysis based off of interpreting, that's what it's for. And so that's really what trichome assurance grading is. And that's what we're working on right now is um, 
really the the reorganizing of it, um, kind of revamping it from the the past, uh, testing it, making sure that what we say to be true is true, and then um, <clears throat> it is not easy to develop. Um, the things that we're publishing, because what we're publishing doesn't exist, right? How do you show the scale of trichome health from a degree of X, Y, and Z in almost any scenario or situation? And then how do you make that learnable? Okay. How do you like it, it, it? What we're doing is not easy to do. Mm -hmm. um, and so I no, hope that no. makes more sense. No, uh, no, I hope, I hope. It does. And, and, you know, part of it, the, the, the reason why we got into this conversation is, you know, we had two uh, interpreters that were uh, judges for last year's uh, uh, Jack Rare Cup. So we had a chance to work with each other. First time I ever had a chance to work with another interpreter. Oh, God. It was so it was like it was like being Eskimos. And we both saw each other in the, in, in the middle of uh, New York City. <laughs> we know each other. We speak the same language. It was phenomenal. It worked so well. We were able to take each other's strengths and came, we almost on every single bug, we came to the same analysis of everything. We were right, you know, and, and went through the same process that we were taught and, and it works perfectly. And that was what started that conversation of saying, okay, we could do this professionally easily, go in and go start looking. And, and you know how it's done in Amsterdam for, a, you know, they make those purchases. It's, it's, well, everywhere, I should say, it's pretty loose, you know, and I, there's just a huge opportunity for this, which leads to the next question, the advanced classes and the advanced classes for your international interpreters. How's, what, what's the schedule and how does that look and what are you thinking about with that? Yeah, so um, again, as I said, the, the amount of um, timing hiccups that were not expected uh, my out-of-state move in uh, dealing with that uh, COVID and the inability to get people together. I mean, you have to understand, we had things on the books to offer this course in Northern California the way that we said we were going to. Um, we had partners lined up and those partners dropped out. Oh. Um, and then California is becoming too difficult to deal with. Uh, from a regulatory perspective, from an accessing cannabis perspective, the fact that they just went um, uh, prepackaged instead of deli style, the way that they yep. used to be, um, it's becoming more and more difficult to work in California. Yep. Uh, the fires, uh, our partners, um, all of a sudden we, you know, some of our partners were fine, you know, helping us do this thing until they learned that there's actually a, like something don't quote me on this, but something around the lines of some California Cannabis Tourism Commission that has rules and regulations of if somebody were to fly in and come to the state and wanted to like take it. It's like, there's, there's so much issue. Red tape. Red tape everywhere. Uh, even for us to advertise that this class exists, there's red tape on the internet. I mean, so it's like, how many brick walls can you throw at us? <laughs> Um, and then, uh, science that still didn't work out other partners that were helping us with that science that a year later just dropped off. Um, all sorts of stuff that has just been an unfortunate calamity. Yeah. Brandon and I are working on the advanced course together today. We're working on the development of tag today. <laughs> I live in Oregon in wine country that is very similar to Sonoma and I'm finding my community here and our access to cannabis here and trying to find all the samples of all the good weed, but man, is it hard to find every example of all the bad weed that nobody wants to admit that they have. Yeah. It is not an easy thing to put this course together uh, in any way. Yeah. We're working on it. Yeah. Um, so I, I, hope, <laughs> I hope that's that helps. Yep. No, that's okay. That gives us that gives us a path forward, and that's that's what we needed to know. Now you have a uh, live stream uh, seminar coming up, right? And then in two days, is it right on Friday? Yes. Yes. That's okay. True. Okay. Uh, and uh, I was I was talking about it on my live show, and and uh, I have no idea what it was, but I said I it was going to be interpreting light. It's uh, what it is. Is it's. Um... 
it's called uh okay so in there, there's something called ama which is called ask me anything uh, that's okay, like yeah. a, a that's a platform right that people do we call it ask max anything okay Good. so it's an ama it's an ask max anything that is um being offered and sponsored by a really cool cbd hemp flower company that can sell you legal high grade high terpy cbd flowers they can ship it straight to your door no matter what state you live in because it's not marijuana um, and so a lot of their, they want to, this is something for their community to learn the technicalities of, around the different cannabis plants, the, uh, type one, type two, type three, what is BLM? What is NLM? Is it Indica? Is it Sativa? It all kind of relates down to interpreting. So just to give the community an opportunity to engage with a cannabis expert, um, to just literally, what do you want to know? What's your biggest questions about cannabis? What's the biggest thing that you're stuck on? Let's just hang out together and talk about it. Um, we only set it up for 100 people. Uh, the second after Green Unicorn Flower sent it out um, and put it on Eventbrite, we had over 100 people sign up, I think, on the first day. So we just opened it up to 500 people. Um, wow. I don't know what our numbers are at, but it's... Um, it's not necessarily for the interpreters who know a lot about interpreting in our world and how this stuff works. It's kind of more for all the people who haven't had that experience yet. Mm -hmm. um, and so I will be going over interpreting uh, quite a bit and it will probably be a lighter version, um, but it's not like I'm teaching a class. Uh, this is literally, they can ask me whatever they want. So if you wanna ask me about peyote, during our CBD flower talk, you can ask me about peyote. So, <laughs> you know, it's interesting, Didia. You know, I'm here in uh, Portugal, and uh, at the uh, I've been looking at a lot of uh, CBD flower mm -hmm. and interpreting CB, uh, CBD flower. And you know, under a microscope, if you didn't know what you were looking at, you know that they could easily, you know, slip it by. Some of the buds here. I mean, and some of the CBD is beautiful, but you can tell, I can tell right away with my nose. I can tell right away with, you know, my taste and depending on how, uh, uh, how fresh uh, the flower is, you can tell with a microscope. Is there an immediate tell for you so you can see it and go CBD? Well, uh, yes and no. Let me say this just to agree with what you're saying, remember I told you that the first university I contracted with for the science trichome project screwed up bad because they thought I was lying to them about, right? Mm -hmm. That university can only work with hemp. And uh, I brought them a high CBD hemp flower that uh, happened to have the seventh trichome on it. And they thought it was marijuana because of how stinky it was and rich they're <laughs> like there's no way this is a hemp plant they're like we're hemp scientists we're hemp researchers you're you're screwing with us this is marijuana you're gonna get us shut down you're gonna get us in trouble wow. and they actually took the plant to a professor's house out of fear that i was lying to them this is the funniest thing they're the wow. science lab that researches what is and isn't hemp so three weeks after they killed my plant by keeping it out of the grow the one plant that we had an opportunity to research I was like, why don't you fucking test it? And then they came back and they're like, oh shit, yeah, you're right. It was a legal hemp plant. Okay. Thank you for ruining our one year project together. <laughs> oh, um, so yeah, that's how serious, uh, you're right. Like, yeah, some of this high CBD hemp flower passes for marijuana because of how good it is. Mm -hmm. Okay, can you tell that it's CBD hemp flower from like an interpreting perspective. Right. Well, you can't interpret anything that is not aromatic. And uh, CBD has no aroma. Right. But uh, at the time that I was growing a lot of CBD varieties in Colorado, um, I did notice a particular typicity of some varieties, particularly Harlequin where 
there was just something about it that just had a different, just ever so different, little subtle look, feel, smell, and, and yeah, smell. Um, that when I approached those, because I locked them in my memory bank, kind of like a sommelier does with yep. wine that they've experienced before, I could, from a freakish perspective, approach flower and be like, oh, seems like Harlequin-ish. Is there, by chance, would you think this is a high CBD varietal? And people were like, oh my God, that's amazing. You could smell, it's like, no, I just locked it, the strain in my memory bank. Um, so I don't know. I don't know. Maybe, uh, we need to, yeah, I, I, I think there, I think we just need a little bit more experience, but I think yeah. there is something there. Well, you know, and, and that leads to that other part where you were talking about, uh, how difficult it was to put together the advanced course. And, you know, to the, to the extent that I've interacted with other interpreters who have now been interpreters for, for a couple of years now. I, I almost think that you're almost like a parent that goes, okay, you've got it, now go, go. And everybody, each one of us have our own and have developed our own little bit, tiny bits of specialties. And, and everybody has their strengths. And, and, and it's, you know, I think it's phenomenal. And again, that's again, leads back to the tag part of this. And I loved the fact that I think in the original design for that, that you had either two or three interpreters that are there to, to evaluate at one time. Is that, was that the original concept? Um, yeah, what we're talking about, what you're talking about is called inter-rater reliability. And so okay. what it is, is if you have one person look at a flower based off of their own information and they come up with a conclusion, um, it's subjective. It's not an objective approach. Mm -hmm. Um, and if you say that you have two people who came up with the same opinion each time over and over again, consistently, it's not just one person's perspective, it's inter rater reliability. So you can rely on the objective aspect that what these people determined is probably more objective than it is subjective due to inter rater reliability. There, can't, there comes a point when you're so good at this and you're so well-trained and you know how to do it so well that having two people grade the same flower the same way twice becomes twice as expensive and twice as time-consuming and might be unnecessary. So in the training aspect, in the certification aspect, you have to use inter-rater reliability. I have to rate your flower the same way you have to rate your flower the same way I would. That's okay. you proving to me you can rate the flowers in this system. And if we can do that a few times over consecutively in our class and I can test you on it and your results are true, right. I'm comfortable certifying that you know how to tag flower and that right. you don't need an inner rater reliability approach after that because of your certification. I see it. Okay. Cool. All right, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> let's go let's, play with some weed. let's go i'm ready what do you got well um i'm with that said it might make more sense to do tag in um in oregon than california based on all the things that i've said mm -hmm. so you know things change over time we tried california man did we try but um so start thinking oregon is what you're saying we should start yeah. thinking you're okay. So now I, I can see the whole uh, Max Montrose uh, dynasty uh, starting to form. Now we start off with a little uh, greenhouse. Next thing we are going to have to have a little dispensary set up a little bit after that. We'll have our shamanic temple uh, and, and uh, mushroom walking experience with uh, nighttime uh, lighting in the trees and the whole thing. Um, <laughs> yeah. You got it. I mean, you might have to put on some big boy boots to hang out the way we do at our place. Cause if you're not prepared for, you know, psychedelic night hikes in a jungle full of 200 pound cats in colored lights with peacocks running around in a psychedelic wonderland, um, might be a lot. 
So. Okay, well, and this, is, this sounds like a great way to finish this because you also, uh, while you were out strolling around in the fields, you had a pretty outrageous kind of uh, UFO-ish type of experience out in the, in the yes. wilderness. Okay. Yes, very recently. Um, okay, were you on any mushrooms when you had this experience? Uh, my Question wife, one. my wife and I were both, um, sober as a button. We were Damn. driving, uh, when this experience happened and we were on our way, uh, into town. So we were, um, in between our house and Eugene, uh, in the woods when it's not what we saw, it's what we experienced, which includes what we saw. Um, but we both experienced the same thing in the same way. And we were both a hundred percent sober. Um, and I mean, here's the deal. I, I've seen UFOs probably half a dozen times in my life. And I'm not talking about that. I maybe thought I saw one. It's like, no, I go to the UFO watchtower in Hooperville, Colorado, outside of Crestone and watch the real deal ships fly out of mountains, come uh, appear like in a blink of an eye and they're just right there and then gone. Uh, all that kind of stuff I've been, you know, into since I was a kid my whole life. And so do you think that's military it? now? No, 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 no. We no, had a, no. I had a conversation with somebody the other night just about this. And, you know, they were talking about the Tic Tacs, you know, that the, the fighter, the fighter saw the other day sure. and oh, they've yeah, talked yeah. to, and, and we've all heard the stories about, uh, the, the alien vessels that they have inside there that, that the military has to have figured out yes. or gained it by now. Yeah, and we I mean, we can show you pictures um, of experimental US Air Force craft that were um, airplanes that were in the shape of saucers yeah. uh, that they tried flying around the desert with. So did you see a flying saucer? And is there evidence that the US government tried to replicate what they learned from? Totally. So is that a really easy excuse to throw in there? Yeah. Uh, has the government achieved the same ability to go outside of our planet's not only understanding, but capability of physics? No, no, no government has yet to create a technology where craft appear as fast as they disappear without any remnants coming from any direction, um, nor have they, could they at this point in time fly as fast as they fly, stop as quick as they stop without, you know, slamming themselves in. And then uh, the, you know, some of the greatest uh, videos of, of UFOs, and there's so many of them, especially mm -hmm. with CE5, um, is when they fly really hard, stop and take a right turn and just. What, what was CE5? Oh, CE5 is the, <clears throat> is the art and science. It is the practice of human initiated extraterrestrial contact. So CE, a close encounter of the first kind is simply seeing a craft. Then there's close encounters of a second kind. Okay. There's a definition of what the third kind is. And there is a fourth type. Uh, and Dr. Stephen Greer, for over 20 years, has not only been teaching, developing, but proving how possible an uh, CE5 is, which is human-initiated extraterrestrial contact. And that means there's a group of people that decides we're going to make contact with an extraterrestrial species. We're going to show them where on planet Earth we are. And we're going to ask them to come hang out with us because we're at a disadvantage from a technology perspective. And because and, the aliens got the killer bug. Well, <laughs> the crazy thing is, is these aliens, they show up. Uh, they show up fast and strong. And it, I mean, you can sit there and just take pictures of them um, in video, their crafts. You can, you can see all this. So you can see this stuff happening in Crestone, Colorado, where uh, I hang out. Right. So um, this stuff is not, <clears throat> doesn't surprise me, right? Like I'm yeah. like, I'm very okay with all of this stuff. Yeah. What yeah. we experienced was really different though. Mm -hmm. Really, 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 really different. <clears throat> and what that was, was, um, uh, 
I, uh, it was in the middle of the night in the forest. I had, it was raining really hard. Um, it was storming so bad that I had to get out and pull trees that had fallen out of the forest, out of the middle of the road so that we could drive. Mm -hmm. Um, and then after I pulled trees out of the road and we're driving in further, there was a, just a massive debris field in the road as if like something crazy happened. And there was just literally the road was just covered in, in tree debris, but only in this one area. And it looked so bizarre that when I got out to look and see if there was any logs or road uh, in the, in the middle of the road that would have popped our tires or made us crash, I just snapped a photo of just how insane the debris field was in front of us. Right. In the second after I, I hit that photo, I leapt into the car and the second I shut the door, uh, night turned to day and day was electric neon turquoise and in every direction and all at once. Hmm. And people are like, well, maybe it was a transformer that blew up. I'm like, listen, if it was a transformer that blew up, it would have blown up from point A into point B. It would have come from somewhere. It nothing came from anywhere. So it was a flash. Daytime, that. no, no, daytime stopped being, I mean, nighttime stopped being night. And somebody flipped a switch where reality in the middle of the night became day. But the day was neon blue. And when it turned Ooh. off, it turned on again. And when it turned off, it turned on one more time. And Kyle and I were just sitting in the car literally in wow. just so much shock and awe and while i was being shocked that this happened one second after i took this photo hopped in the car and all of a sudden we're having this experience i was fumbling for my phone the whole time and i started recording one second after uh the last light turned off yeah and you can hear kyle and i being terrified uh um, yeah and not i heard that what was going on i didn't even know until the next day that when i compared the time that I took the picture, hopped in the car, and only a few seconds had gone by till I started recording. And you can see the time I took the picture and the time I started the recording, there was a 10 minute gap in between that time. The amount of people that uh, DM'd me and said that they had the exact same experience, same light, same color, night turned to day. I probably had a dozen different people from the around the world say, dude, nobody believes me. I have the exact same experience. I know in the bottom of my heart, it was extraterrestrial. I was in the, it was nowhere where like what in the middle of the forest, in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of the night, mm -hmm. what technology do you think we have that would be used for what reason that would have caused any of this? You cannot come up with anything. There's nothing mm -hmm. that explains it, but none of these people had documented the lapse in time as, as intensely as I had. And so it's, it still puts uh, hairs on the back of my neck to know that we had an experience that was very alien and 10 minutes of our lives are entirely unaccounted for and, wow. and we can basically prove it. And so it's. How uh, trippy is that? Yeah. Okay. So, okay. So, so I know you have a great imagination. What do you think happened? Did you, first of all, did you check all your orifices? Make sure you weren't raped by little green guys, you know, because that, that's the Saturday Night Live girl, you know, when, when everybody said, oh, we saw colors, and then she goes, oh, no. <laughs> um, I think there was an extraterrestrial presence in the forest that was interested in the uh, trees that were about to be destroyed. Uh, which happened the day after uh, they leveled the forest right in that space. And okay. I don't know what the entity was doing there or why, but I feel like when I took the picture that I did, it might have thought I was interacting with it because it could have it it could tell here's an intelligence with a technology capturing this moment or using mm -hmm. it or or something there's something here. Right. Um, and uh, I think that, entity caused something to happen which is what caused the blue light to happen and while that was happening it's very possible that they could have slowed down um our existence into a total standstill right where they had a 10 minute time period to kind of freeze our reality so mm -hmm. you're in a blue world yeah. and you think no amount of time is going by 
when really they have 10 minutes to come check you out. Yeah. Who are you? you? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Pat you down. Um, check out your phone. See what you were up to. Uh, <laughs> is this someone we want to take back with us? Mm-hmm. Did we take them back with us and drop them back off at home? Uh, is our 10 minute perspective a 2000 year perspective that that from their end? And see, my mind immediately goes to the fact that because both of you do have experience with taking uh, lots of different types of hallucinogens, and you've been able to really, truly open up that, that third eye, it gives you a different type of a, a beam, so to speak, so that you might be more receptive to something like this. Well, yeah, I mean, I mean, this is, what I'm about to tell you, I, I, I haven't told anyone, and it's something that I've been challenged with in the past couple of years, which is imagine how many humans were wondering what was under the ocean before we ever had the technology to go down there and see it. Mm -hmm. So you know that there's this entire world, or you think that there's this whole world. You have no idea where these creatures go, where they're coming from. You just see them show up on shore. But all of a sudden, we finally got to a point in our existence where we could go underwater and see what's there. And what we discovered is it's an entirely different planet that works in an entirely different way with different creatures that are totally alien. And it's an entire world, but it's on our planet. Then the same thing with outer space. We always just assumed like, you know, they're might be other planets there might be other universes there might be other galaxies but um it took quite a while for us to get to a point where we as a species cannot unsee what we've now been able to see Mm -hmm. we've seen what's under the ocean and know that we can have only explored one percent of it it's an alien world on our planet and then there's alien planets in the trillions surrounding our planets. There is a a universe. We can't unknow that, we can't unsee that. But I've been shown things that are beyond what's under the ocean and how vast the universe is. I've been given the gift and the ability to bear witness to the magnitude of the different levels and dimensions of the matrix as they're happening simultaneously. I know I've seen what this world looks like 2,000 years from now. How I've are we seen doing? this world 2,000 years in the past. I've also seen the different dimensions that exist in between the folds that are hiding behind the scenes in front of your perspective of what you call reality in this moment. Mm. It's hard to just walk around with got a few too many secrets in there it's just hard to be normal after that (laughs) it's like how do the how do you even how do you tell planet earth that you are the only one who's who got to see what was under the ocean a thousand years before the rest of humanity was allowed to see it Mm -hmm. you know you would be called crazy You know, if you talked about coral reefs and octopi and stuff like that a thousand years ago, you would just be insane. Right. And so um, I respect people who think I'm crazy because they have no experience with what I've experienced. Sometimes it's hard to just wake up in the morning and do your email after that. (laughs) (laughs) you're like what's the point what is all this dumb shit we're doing (laughs) it's like like that it's like all of a sudden it's like wait let's go back to the torah like let's go back to jerusalem five thousand seven hundred years ago as a desert people that were being exposed to truly alien technologies and mathematics that taught species on this planet how to build pyramids at a precise level at the same centimeter in different parts of the world thousands of years ago prior to intercontinental communication. That information doesn't come from this planet. It comes from where a lot of information comes, which is from above. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. 
it's yeah it's it's not easy being I mean I've never been normal but it's just sometimes it's hard to just keep doing regular um American normal things yeah it's like there's there's more there's a there's a lot more that's sacred out there that that means a lot more than you know the rules and regulations that cops care about like you, you smoking pot in North Carolina it's like man the, is there so much more going on that mm-hmm. people really need to be concerned with in their lives that they're entirely <laughs> unaware of um yeah I I have a lot of information that I've been gifted on how quickly all of this will end uh, in our time period. And it's it's hard to know that and to just kind of keep going as if these things aren't about to happen um, or take place around the corner. Mm. So, um, you know, so my father, uh, you know, uh, was was an interesting man and uh, he had a thing about uh uh, visions and being able to see things in the future and yeah. uh he was you know a complete atheist was never a spiritual man you know i told you he was a coke guy yeah uh, uh much more black and white about things and uh he said at one point i will believe anybody that can see the future the first time that one pulls off a lottery ticket says that's the one he says when i see the first time that somebody says i can see into the future i can see i've seen things i this is what i can do here's the thing on saturday lotto numbers 9 23 16 da 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 he says when somebody does that i'm going to believe anybody can 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 see into the future it's very interesting because when you have the the, the, you look at somebody like Nostradamus, for an example, right? Who wrote all those fantastic uh, quatrains, is that correct? They were quatrains, I believe, about, uh, about the future, right? I think they were quatrains. Um, I could be wrong, we'll check that. I'm looking out. for something while you're telling me, keep talking, nope, keep talking. No worries. Uh, so he talked about being able to see things in a very, what I would say, pretty, pretty remarkable, uh, link up to things that actually happen uh, over hundreds of years. You know, for me personally, I think that the anything is possible. Um, I'm, you know, I after hanging out with Mila a little bit, uh, the hash queen, I'm I'm taking a much more kind of a, a, a living in the moment type of uh, atmosphere uh, or attitude about things. Uh, I, it's a, one of the reasons why I haven't asked you that question. You know, I asked her very famously, uh, what was the best hash you've ever smoked? And she says, what I'm smoking right this second. Oh yeah. And right. So I won't ask you what the best weed is that you've ever smoked. Cause I'm sure you're very introspective or, or should I ask you, what is the best weed that you are going to smoke? Um, I don't even know if that matters. What I was going to share with you was, you know, because my perspective on the weed that I like um, shouldn't matter to anybody else. It just, it shouldn't even be important. Um, well, no. I, I but what I, but, with that. No, 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 yeah. no. Wait, if you, if you can't, if you opened your own dispensary, a, a Max huh? Montrose, dude, you're immediately become one of the biggest, hottest brand names in the world in two seconds maybe yeah um maybe um the i mean okay so like from from a cannabis perspective and and from that i would say um i would give customers an opportunity to explore um the truth of cannabis that i've been so privileged to experience by giving people an opportunity to have the farthest end of the spectrum and everything in between Right. And so most dispensaries just offer really high quality pot. Um, and some of it's a little more sedative and some of it's more a little more um, stimulating. Uh, I would give people an opportunity to have the most intensely, not only stimulating, but um, psychedelic forms of cannabis that I've experienced that there are and actually teach them how to actually consume the cannabis in a way that 
would increase the opportunity for it to be even more psychedelic. Oh, um, okay. Right. And so like, um, I've done a, car- a cannabis ceremony before where we did cannabis, but ceremoniously. And this is one of my funniest stories. Cause I was the, I was the, the, the asshole in the group who everyone was like, go ahead, tell us what you really, you know, think about this. And I'm like, really, you want me to tell you? I was like, all right. I said, I don't think anything's going to happen because there's no way in hell you're going to let me take one puff of weed and expect something like religious or like, like this just crazy because I have such a high tolerance. Yeah. And this group of people laughed at me. They're like, they're like, "Uh uh-huh. That's what you think, but we're going to try cannabis in a different way. I said, okay, I'm, I'm open-minded and one puff of cannabis, even with my crazy high tolerance, um, I tripped out harder than most DMT experiences have had. I hallucinated so hard. My body was shaking off the floor so big. I mean, my body was like a dead fish flopping on the ground, processing dross and negative information. I mean, I was almost like from, from smoking to weed. Moon, from taking one hit of regular ass weed. <laughs> and it's like, and there's a... <laughs> it's it's there's there's a little bit more context to um to does anybody have to get naked no uh (laughs) although although i did just make a little video of me teaching people how to grow mushrooms naked uh i haven't published it yet oh okay Um, I, I, I highly recommend it from a uh from a sterile perspective i i put myself in a um in a bleached clean room with that's a vacuum under UVA, UVB, and dangerously UVC light while I'm butt naked after a deep clean, uh, and then also showered in a, a 99% isopropyl alcohol bath. Um, wow. And when I transfer my mycelium plates and uh, when I grow mushrooms, um, I grow mushrooms naked. <laughs> so uh, that's awesome. It is did awesome. You, it's like. Did you- did you watch what? the episode that I just did on uh, last week with uh, Ian Bollinger? Um, no. The, the, who runs the psilocybin cup. Okay, so this he is really interesting. About okay, yeah. so they, he does testing on the magic mushrooms using the HPLC testing yes. equipment, okay? Yeah. Uh, so I knew you'd be familiar with this. So, I, so I, I mean, did you know how this is how, you, could you do your, could you test your uh, cacti the same way? Uh, possibly, um, it, it depends on a, on a couple different things, but I will say, um, one of my friends, let me turn up my screen here see if I can show you this. I don't know if I, yeah, I'll, I'll show you this. One of my friends, uh, just sent me this. He just got his strain of mushrooms that he created himself in his lab, uh, tested. And I believe it's by the same HPLC. Mm-hmm. And so he's getting readings on how potent his psychedelic oh, mushrooms yes. are. Okay. And, you know, there is psilocybin and there is psilocin, yes. but there's yes. also norpicillin, yep. erigenicin, mm-hmm. biocystin, and nor- I mean, dude, like- Okay, you have, you have to watch the episode because he- I'm going to send it to me, just yeah. text I'll text it to me. <laughs> you know, the other thing which I found fascinating is that when they're doing the cup, they do it in uh, four different categories. So they start with micro dosing, then there's recreational, there's therapeutic, and then there's spiritual. And each one has the dosing levels for each one. It's, it, it's fantastic. He's a wonderful guy. I'd love to connect the two of you together because uh, uh, he's, he's definitely at the top of his field uh, as, as you are in yours. All right. Can I... I, I want to share one thing with you based on what you said about your dad and believing the future. And if somebody could do the lottery thing. Yeah. I wish I could show your dad um, our ability of um, remote viewing. And do you know about this? Yeah, I've heard things about it, but I don't know it to obviously your level. Please tell me more. Okay, so one of my brothers from mystery school gave me an education and an experience on um, on uh, remote viewing. So what he did is he put a 
photograph that I've never seen before in an envelope. And he handed me the envelope and he gave me a code, which was just random set of numbers and said, I attached what the image is to this code. Put the code in your mind and decode it to tell me what inside the folder, the image inside the folder. Whoa, okay. Okay. Interesting. So this is my actual VR session. These are my actual notes. Mm -hmm. And I wrote down what I saw in my mind, uh, what the photo was in this manila folder. My notes said ballerina dancer, sand on a warm beach, a shining light like sun or a light from on a stage, like pointing down, mm -hmm. a known moment in time, like a memory with no emotion, a memory, knowingness plus a feeling. Mm -hmm. Then he opened up the envelope and this is what was inside. <clears throat> oh, look at that. <laughs> Perfect. Well like a, a woman dancing on a beach with the angle of the sun coming down from this one moment. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> then the person next to me wasn't done with the photograph in their envelope. So I decided to put my mind into what their envelope was just for fun. And I said, eyes watching a red vibration out of a box, colors, blues and greens, carpet patterns. Then I open, she opened her envelope and it's a woman watching this water that looked like these carpet patterns with these blue and green bridge in front of her that she was, I mean. Wow, yeah. I, and so it's like, you don't really need to win the lottery. You could just sit down next to me with a photograph and an envelope and I could tell you what the image is without ever seeing it. You know, listen, you don't have and, to convince me. I've been telling people <laughs> since I've met you the very first time that you are the Obi-Wan Kenobi of weed. And now <laughs> you have you have already done went to the next level, legit Obi-Wan Kenobi of weed. Listen, <laughs> my master, you know, look, whatever you need, I'm here. Uh, the, That's you know, awesome. the, the, it, I know our show is not about esotericism. I just wanted to lay you this one fact for you. Cool. The CIA actually unclassified all of their reporting on them training CIA agents to become highly proficient in remote viewing for the mm -hmm. purpose of, uh, in their minds, seeing the information that would be classified and written, hiding in files in Russia. Okay, this is trainable. Yeah. I, on that on that Instagram post where I posted my my personal VR training, mm -hmm. a remote viewing evolution uh, evaluation protocol. Here is the documentation of the CIA and their entire program um, to do this. It is, I believe, it's the Stargate project. Ooh. A remote viewing evaluation protocol for release. This was released in uh, 2000. Uh, this was being done in December 1982. Um, yep, this is the collection from Stargate files. So this is this is the CIA training operatives to um, become uh, what's it called uh, when you use your mind to mind read? Yeah, they're just training uh, government agents to mind read top secret files and other, I mean, like. Telepathy? Telepathy. The shit that people make movies about, yeah. the weirdest thing is 99% of the time they're based in something actual, um, very real. And so I, I love that stuff. Damn, damn. Okay, so now <laughs> that, I hope this is a course. Here, I hope this we, is a we, course. Can we can we can we turn this into a course? Because I'm on that. I'm on that. I'm in. You, you know what the problem is with uh, teaching government telepathy and talking about alien experiences and psychedelics all at the same time. Uh oh. Is all the crusty old conservatives just are very sure of what all of this is? Yeah. You guys must be fucking high 
because <laughs> don't tell me you're eating psychedelic drugs and then you're seeing you know aliens and re it's like i wasn't intoxicated when i saw the aliens i sure as hell wasn't intoxicated when i was doing my remote viewing protocols i mean like you just you understand that there's that there, there's there, there's it's like oh yeah of course this all makes sense you guys are 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 just you're high out of your minds yeah well see the thing that they don't understand also is that you are a sick scientist and you also are somebody that doesn't stick with something in your head when you uh you know you've made some changes from the original interpreting book that you determined later was was wrong and you know that was another one of the things that that really drew me into admiring you even more is the fact that you know you're not so stubborn or on that level that you can't say you know what there's there's another answer here there's another uh, uh, another better option and uh, you know again huge respect but no serious on that class I want that class I want remote viewing class live stream do you want me to tell you this do you want me to tell you the secret of how remote viewing works that is actually the coolest part of it yes you're not actually using telepathy at all okay you're just remembering what you already saw you're not actually using telepathy at all okay you're just remembering what you already saw Ooh, damn okay so tell me how i use this one <laughs> it's uh once you've been through the matrix it, that makes a lot more sense you're oh, like damn i gotta go through the matrix to do this shit yeah now. you gotta you gotta be in different dimensional space to understand it's like wait the thing i haven't seen yet i remember mm -hmm. it's like mm -hmm. yeah because you only think you haven't seen it before you've seen this so many times that if you just dig back into your remember your memory bank You'll just re-remember the photo you've already seen before. This is not the first time this event has happened. Uh -huh. um, in fact, it's kind of happening a thousand times over in 10,000 different ways in this moment. So just tap into that. You're just remembering. <clears throat> it's like, oh man. Thinking of, I'm remembering all the poker games I've lost now because I wasn't remembering <laughs> properly. <laughs> yeah, man. Uh, I, you know, it's like, I'm trying to remember my, the move I made on the stock market three days from now. <laughs> God, I love this. Um, <laughs> so, you know, that's, that's a real thing too. Uh, I, I know how busy you are and, and I, I, I don't want to take up any more of your time because my next question that I, I, I have three more questions to ask you here and the next one just by itself, I think is at least an hour long answer. Oh, so God. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to um, uh, beg off at this moment and, and see if it's possible that somewhere in the future, uh, the next time you come back to this coffee shop, if maybe I can get a, a, a version number two or a round two, because I want to start, and I'll just I'll let you know now. I need to know more about the Masons and the Freemasonry and that mm -hmm. aspect of this, which is a whole nother adventure. I'll leave you with this. If the Freemasons were not a secret society in the past, the United States of America would never have existed. And that's a fact. And it's also a fact that today Freemasonry is no longer a secret society. And that's a fact, because if it were, every lodge that exists wouldn't have a Facebook page, an address on Google, a phone number. You wouldn't be able to call the secretary, tell them that you don't know anything about Freemasonry, but you'd like to learn yeah. and have them invite you to the lodge and go have dinner with them and you can bring your wife. They're not going to tell you what they experienced in degree work because you didn't earn it yet. But if you want to earn it, you can. I'll leave you with that. It's like candy. 
<laughs> it's like, yeah, I'll leave you with that. I love it. Thank right, you, Captain. Cancer. I really Thank appreciate you. your time. Thank you. You you were fantastic and uh, enjoy your, your wonderful life up there. And I love all your Instagram posts and I will put all of your socials up here so that everybody will know how to follow you and track you. And hopefully we'll have more. Uh, uh, I need some more interpreters here in Europe to work with. Cool. All right. Well, much love to you, Captain. Thanks for being the captain of good ganja around the world in all the different countries and places you are and uh, getting all of our voices out there and spreading it on the interwebs. Hopefully this one can break through some uh, some interwebbing black clouds so um, uh, we can get some cool information out to some more new people. So I really appreciate everything you do, Captain. Thank you. And, uh, I need to send you a new toolkit. So we got to update you. So um, yes. send me your current address and the best way to hook you up with a, a new book and, and all that jazz. And absolutely. I'll be sure to do that, my friend. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Peace out. You. And we will see you again soon. Bye. What's happening, everybody? Welcome back. I'm still here at it. I'm enjoying this. This is actually kind of cool. I can get into doing this a little more often. What did I tell you about Max Montrose? Was that amazing or what? Yeah, I know. All right, listen, this has been a fantastic show. Oh, wait a second. Maybe we have time for Hit It. Hello, Stoners and Vipers. Here, a quick butt report from Herbert M. Green, me. Today we're going to talk about a nug I found at Coffee Shop Family First, and they called it Ice Pie. This, this whole bud uh, gave me a bit of a paradoxal feeling. It, the nug itself uh, has this typical uh, NLM structure. It was very light green with spots of purple. At first glance, this bud had a thick, snowy trichome coat which also accounts for the slight gray hue of the entire nug. But when I looked closer, the trichomes were quite hard to spot. Uh, they were small, uh, there weren't very many trichomes, and they were very clear. They were completely clear, no opaque, no amber colored trichomes. So that was a bit suspicious. Yet the aroma was very present. It had a heavy, earthy, herbaceous uh, uh, tone like most BLMs. Yet it had all the hallmarks and undertones of an NLM. So you'd say this is probably a hybrid. Uh, perfect mix between the two. Yet my T-nerve definitely told me we were dealing with a narrow leaf marijuana type of camouflage. The highlights of this nug were, uh, in the aroma, were very heavy, woody, uh, like sandalwood and incense. I also got a little bit of hops there. Um, it also was very herbaceous, with a hint of smoky sweetness on the end. And that would suggest for me that it's uh, packed full with humulene, alpha and beta uh, pinene, probably some myrcene in there as well, and some uh, terpinoline. Uh, that was that, that sort of like sharp edge to the herbaceousness. The undertone, on the other hand, was very NLM. Uh, it was strong turpentine undertone with a tangy citrus edge, almost like bergamot, and maybe even some camphor. And that would suggest that there is a lot of L-limonene in there, uh, some osamine maybe, uh, some fenciol maybe, and uh, some borneol, definitely. Flavor is very earthy. I get that same sharp undertone of the uh, turpentine, maybe some uh, bergamot. Just very earthy, forced like it almost tastes like a kush, but it's definitely not a kush. Uh, again, uh, what I said, my T nerves give this a most definite NLM, narrow leaf marijuana uh, vibe. And if I concentrate on the effects right now, I can feel the same. It's very heady, immediately hits uh, the top of my head. 
not very euphoric but energetic for sure so yeah i would pet this as a nlm but if you find yourself in amsterdam and you find yourself close to the amstel go to uh, coffee shop family first and try their camel far named ice pie maybe you will find the same things i have just noticed or maybe you will have a completely different uh, experience please let me or captain know and i will be back with a new bot report soon bye guys good morning captain Hooter. wake and bake a tyson versus tyson matchup today coming from the beautiful uh outdoors of northern michigan um we have uh we have two new two new strains available to us um these are both available recreationally um so anybody 21 or older uh can come to the state of michigan and purchase these um i believe they're currently only available at common citizen uh which is downstate um but uh i'm sure it's going to be moving around uh so the two strains that i've chose are pound for pound cake and dynamite cookies Pound for pound cake is coming in at a THC of a little under 23%, uh, almost no CBD, and a little over 2% of terpenes. So, you know, 10% of the terpenes, 10% uh, ratio between THC and, and terpenes, that's, that's a good ratio. Um, this is also pretty fresh, uh, harvest date of March 16th. So this is um, uh, about one, less than one month on the shelf, so to speak. Um, dynamite cookies, uh, THC is a little bit under 18% and total terpenes are at, uh, 0.75, 0.76%, um, a little bit less. I could tell from the packaging, this one had more volume than this one. This one was more, I don't know, I kind of puffed them up, they've been open, but, um, this one had more volume than this one. This one was much more compact and it kind of rattled around. It had a little more of a, well, I could tell there were dense little buds in there. Now, I know you're a fight of the fans, so or you're a fan of the fights, so <laughs> I have wake and bake. Um, I know you're a fan of the fights, so uh, so here's the matchup. In this corner, pound for pound cake. Uh, let's, let's, let's get our face in it. Let's smell it. As a fellow interpreter, I know that this is, um, this is the mana. This is the good stuff. Mm, this is um, this is earthy and herbal, and it's got a um, it's got a sweetness at the end that doesn't prevail when you open it and you stick your face in it. The sweetness comes at the end, and it's um, it's like a dark fruit. Um, it's nice. It's really nice. Um, overall, I would consider this to be a sweet smelling bud. Um, I don't get anything like limonene or any spiciness. Uh, no pepperiness, uh, no pine. Um, so I will say earthy and herbal with some, uh, some sweet or dark fruits on the end. It's pleasant. It's pleasant. Um, now I have smoked this. Um, the effects for me are very gelato. I would not be surprised if this was Sherbinsky genetics um, with the... Hmm, there's a certain kind of like a reminiscent cerebral burst to the high when it first hits that rush of it um, that that I often put with uh, my dog uh, with uh, with gelato. Um, but uh, we have we have real you know certified Sherbinsky genetics here in the state, and um, I think these are grown in the same facility. So. Um, smells good um the effects uh there's a nice body load uh that came in a nice body high that uh it wasn't a lingering load but it was a body high that carried through um for a while uh that was another thing that made me kind of feel like it was gelato very similar in like the extension of the high beyond the, that initial rush if you get that um 
you know the the extension of the of the the body high and how long it lasts and stuff so anyway um dynamite cookies uh, dynamite cookies off the label i didn't think much the way it sounded in the bag it didn't have bag appeal and i'm not showing these buds because mm, i'll save time Dynamite cookies. This one is simpler. I would call this one herbal and earthy. Where the first one was earthy and herbal, I would call this one herbal and earthy, meaning the herbal is primary on this one. There might be a little bit of spiciness in there. Maybe a little curiosity. I'm not mm, mm, guessing. Like, that's kind of a reach. I wouldn't call it spicy. Um, but it's a, a simpler aroma. And this one was... Uh, harvest date was... February 4th, 22. So this one's a little bit older, um, but you know, these are, these are pre-weighed or these are, um, you know, pre-packs that aren't meant for, for long-term storage. Uh, not really, not in my opinion. So, um, this is what I would call commercial cannabis. Um, now dynamite cookies is dynamite. All right. I got a little bit of a beef with broke my favorite grinder that's right it broke my grinder now now let me say this is an old grinder it had an acrylic top with a crank it kind of looked like an old coffee grinder it was a favorite it had a nice big high volume canister and the uh the keef screen just i think it magically produced keef i think it fell out of the screen i don't think it came from the weed itself because it there was a never-ending supply and, um, you know, I, I broke up this dense bud and it was very dense, very, very dense. Uh, these little pebbles, I broke them up, you know, as small as my fingers would, would take them, put them in my grinder and it wouldn't budge. Oh, okay. And I was careful, you know, I knew it was gauging and there were some cracks in it already. I backed off the top and gave it a little, oh, not ready yet. Took it all the way off and just kind of like set it on there and just, uh, like, all right. Got a little bit, got a little bite, got a little bite. I got about three quarters of the way through this thing and then it just started spinning free. Oh. Broken beyond repair. Sad day. Dynamite cookies, you knocked out my grinder. And let me say that for me personally, the effects of it um, suit my taste better. Uh, I would call this a uh, sedating, um, likely a broadleaf uh, hybrid or broadleaf dominant um, indica. A lot of people would call it. Um, but this was the primary primary effect was um, uh, sedation and relaxation. It wasn't a total couch lock. It wasn't. This isn't a strong, you know, bud. But it's fairly fresh. Um, and it has an appropriate amount of THC. It's not like, you know, some skanky, you know, thing grown behind the garage. Um, not that beautiful strain that grown behind the garage. So, um, <laughs> anyway, dynamite cookies. You broke my grinder. You broke my heart. You win this one. Ding, ding, ding. Um, these are available here in Michigan. For thirty dollars an eighth. That's commercial weed for you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Captain, thank you for the uh, for the time and the space, and uh, maybe I'll bring some more matchups. Maybe I'll find you some good craft weed. Until next time, wake and bake. Thank you for listening.
<laughs> you guys didn't think we were going to have a, a show with Max Montrose and then not have any interpreters on there, right? How about those reviews, right? There's levels to this stuff, guys. And I'll tell you what, I'm an honor to be part of the Tricom Institute. And in fact, I set up a little special deal for you guys at the end of this. So make sure you read the credits again. Thank you so much. It's an honor for me to be able to create these shows for you. And we will see you on Wednesday of next week with a brand new Wake and Beak with Captain Hooter. All right, everyone. I'll see you then. Bye. <laughs> it's Captain Hooter.